So um, today uh, I'm going to continue talking about uh, the Roman Empire. I've got, um, I think the main main things I'll be talking about is the later, the later Roman Empire I'll be getting into today. And uh, I'd already gotten into... Um, And um, let me see where I'm at right now. Uh, overall, share the um, lecture with you. There it is right there. And uh, so I think we were just talking about the period of the five good emperors, uh, which started about 96. Uh, and I think I had just gotten into, I had talked about how Domitian had been assassinated. He'd been one of the last of the uh, so-called Flavian dynasty emperors. He was killed in 96. And they had the so-called period of the five good emperors that followed from 96 to 180. And it had two dynasties, one called Nerva and the other one called Antonine. There were actually two. They were separate from each other. And I kind of, I think I already went through it already. I'd already talked about this already right here, but I had talked about how those are the different emperors uh, that were part of uh, the Nerva Antonine, uh, five good emperors, uh, which ruled during that peak period of the Pax Rabana. And um, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian were all part of the Nerva dynasty. And they had Antoninus, Marcus Aurelius, also Commodus, I mentioned too, was also part of it, it was part of what they call the Antonine dynasty. So you had the Nerva and the Antonine dynasties. And they're sometimes put together as kind of like two, but it's really one. And I think I had already talked about Nerva. Nerva was the one that started the whole thing, the so-called period of five good emperors. And uh, he only reigned for a short time, but um, he started the whole Nerva dynasty, which included him and Trajan and Hadrian, who were two Roman generals uh, that came after. And uh, I think I told you Nerva was actually an advisor to Domitian, who took over after Domitian was killed. He was actually a Roman senator. Uh, but he was only in power for a short time. And uh, all the emperors later are referred to uh, as being called adoptive emperors because of the fact that they were um, had this adoption process where they would adopt their successor, like the best one for the, for the position or whatever. And so that's how that process began. And most of the emperors are actually picked that way, uh, more or less, except for communists, which wasn't. But pretty much all the good emperors were picked in that fashion, more or less. So uh, Marcus Trajan, who I need to talk about next, was, of course, a famous Roman general. That became the successor uh, to, of course, Nerva, uh, who would eventually come in power. You know, the slide right here. His full name is Marcus Ulpius Trajanus. Well, they usually call him Trajan for short. And... Um, the thing about Trajan, Trajan was actually uh, originally from um, Spain. He was actually a Spanish um, general, uh, and um, he reigned about, you can see, 19 years, about 98 to 117. He was kind of this military-style general uh, that um, was very popular. A lot of people, a lot of Romans liked uh, Trajan. Uh, and uh, he was actually at one point called Optimus Princeps, uh, which means um, best ruler is what it actually means. Yeah, best ruler. So he's a very, very ambitious uh, ruler. Uh, one of the best ambitious you know, generals probably since the time of Julius Caesar uh, and all that. Uh, and um, you got this map here under his reign, the Roman Empire peaked in size. Uh, it got pretty large, uh, which was somewhere between like two to three million square miles, uh, which I think 117, I think, is considered to be the peak period of, of the Roman Empire. Um, let me go right here. And um, his empire stretched at one point all the way to the Black Sea region uh, with him being involved in numerous conquests, like around the Black Sea. Uh, one area you can see, which is right here in the map, 
above is an area called Dacia. I'll kind of highlight it for you uh, right here, but it's basically right in this area. This is called Dacia. And Dacia is what they call Romania today, or Romania, Bulgaria. I think Romania is down here, Bulgaria up here. But that's basically the area that he eventually conquered. They think he also may have conquered this area here around the Crimea. Also where like Ar Armenia is, which is up in here somewhere, Armenia and also what we call Georgia. Uh, those areas were areas that he also conquered as well, close to the Caspian Sea at one point. Then under him, the empire um, was able to expand eastward to like the Tigris River Basin, like in Iraq. And then also down here, they kind of expanded here where part of Jordan and Israel is today. It was like an area he took over. So most of his conquests were in the east. Uh, and one more thing about uh, Trajan that's well known, uh, of course, he was very famous for his um, building projects, uh, the so-called Trajan's Forum, uh, constructed uh, in the um, second century, early second century by Trajan. And uh, the Trajan's Forum uh, included like a series of markets, baths uh, that he constructed, often called Trajan's Bath. It was there, uh, still there, the ruins. It also included this uh, victory column that they put in the middle called Trajan's Column, which you can see erected there. It's got a statue on top of them. It's about 100 feet tall. And uh, so that was one thing about Trajan. He was known for giving back to, you know, the people of Rome. And that's something that a lot of these Roman emperors were really known for. So his reign is really the peak of the empire. Uh, then they have another emperor come in whose name is Hadrian, uh, the third of the good, five good emperors uh, after uh, Nerva and Trajan. Uh, and um, Hadrian reigned, um, you can see there, about 21 years, 117 to 138. He was also Spanish too. Uh, hey, Claude. Um, Talking about the Roman Empire. And uh, anyway, um, Hadrian um, was of Spanish origin, just like uh, Trajan was. And um, he was adopted. Uh, and um, the thing about Hadrian that was different from Trajan, Trajan was uh, kind of a military military guy like Trajan was. But he was also into the um, arts. He was a patron of the arts. Uh, he was often called the Greekling, uh, Hadrian, because of his fondness for Greek culture, Greek architecture. And uh, one thing that's very famous about Emperor Hadrian uh, was that he was well known for being an amateur architect, like building structures, buildings, uh, and so on. And uh, one of the most famous things that Emperor Hadrian constructed, which if you go back and watch the video at the beginning uh, that I showed you, uh, was, of course, he's the one that, of course, constructed Hadrian's Wall. Uh, and um, so I have the slide here if you want to look at that later. But Hadrian's Wall, Hadrian's Wall um, was the, was a um, fortification that was built by the Roman army. Uh, you can see constructed in the 120s uh, AD or CE. And uh, it was a um, it was basically the northern border of the Roman Empire in Roman Britain. It was actually constructed to defend their northern border from Scottish barbarians that were above, you know, where England is today. I think mostly groups like the Picts, P-I-C-T-S, the Picts, uh, they were trying to keep out. And um, the wall stretched from the North Sea to the Irish Sea uh, over something like 80 Roman miles, which I think is actually under 80 miles. And um, so it was a huge wall they put there. And uh, the wall itself was made of like squared stone, which they talked about in the little short video. Uh, and um, the original width, you see, was about 10 feet wide. The height, they're not sure. The height varies. But the height of the wall was somewhere anywhere between 15 and 50, 15 and 20 feet tall. But up to modern times, it was stripped away. And so a lot of pictures, if you ever, you know, see Hadrian's Wall or view pictures of it or whatever, a lot of it's been stripped away, like the top of the actual wall. 
what you're looking at there. Uh, parts have, have been preserved. I think a lot of it's been like rebuilt uh, today. Uh, it included like little fortifications. They also put, uh, like they put like every one mile, they put these mile castles that they constructed uh, to, you know, house troops there to protect the wall. So if anybody attacks the wall, you know, they could then try to stop them. So, like I said, Hadrian's Wall was like the northernmost border uh, of the Roman Empire. All right. Uh, oh, the other thing that Hadrian did too, uh, which is very famous, uh, is uh, he's the Hadrian's the one that uh, also built what they call the Pantheon Temple, uh, which was built uh, in Rome, uh, and um, this was actually a temple uh, that. Um, had been built under Emperor Augustus like a long time ago. Uh, in fact, it was built by Marcus Agrippa. It's got its name on the front of the building. And um, what happened was it was uh, struck by lightning or something and caught on fire. It burned down. Uh, and so what happened was um, Hadrian decided to redesign it and, and rebuild it, uh, which he did uh, during his reign. And uh, it kind of melded like Roman and Greek architecture, like the front of the building. Um, the front of the building has like, looks like a Greek temple, basically with, you know, mostly looks like Corinthian columns on the front. And then the back of it has got this dome type structure building uh, that was built with it. And um, that's something it's famous for. Uh, the Romans were the ones that kind of invented the dome, if you know about it. And uh, the actual building was completed around 132 uh, CE. They called it Pantheon because it was constructed to uh, be a temple that was supposed to honor like all of the Roman gods, like Greek and Roman gods. Uh, so that's why it's kind of called that name. Uh, some people confuse it with the Parthenon. It's kind of a similar name, but it's, it's not the same. So Pantheon with an N. And... Um, it does have like a 142 foot wide dome on it. And it is known for having this opening in the middle. Uh, it's called an oculus, which you can look up and during the day you can, it lets light in, which is right there. So, so yeah, I completed about, yeah, 125, I think might be the date when they think it was finished. I think later it was actually used as a church uh, by the Roman Catholic church, but I think it's now more like a museum. Uh, today. All right, let me go ahead and move on, of course, and talk about next. I need to get into and talk about the um, Antonines uh, that come in next. Um, Antonine dynasty. Uh, the Antonines were around from 161 to 192. So about 31 years, uh, they were a dynasty. They had four rulers that were in it. You had, of course, the founder, which you see up there, Antoninus Pius. He's got created it. He was the fourth of the five good emperors. Uh, they had Marcus Aurelius, who was his nephew, nephew by uh, by marriage. Uh, it was actually his wife's nephew. Uh, Lucius Verus was actually adopted uh, along with Marcus Aurelius. They were kind of like they were kind of like brothers, but they were adopted brothers. And then number four of the Antonines, Commodus. So they had four of them in it. Probably won't talk too much about Lucius Verus. I'll get more into the others uh, overall. Uh, Antoninus Pius wasn't known for too much. Uh, predominantly, his reign was like the most peaceful. Uh, in fact, his reign was the peak of the Pax Romana. Uh, his, in fact, he's the third longest reigning ruler of the whole uh, Roman Empire after um, Augustus and um, Tiberius, reigning at 23 years, uh, roughly. And... Um, I think I've got a slide or a picture of him, which is right here. There wasn't too much happen under him, like militarily. I think the only thing they did uh, was they conquered up to the Firth of Forth, uh, which is Scottish-English border right here. And uh, he did construct a wall up here called the Antonine Wall, which you see right here, uh, which was supposed to replace Hadrian's Wall. But after he died, they went back to Hadrian's Wall. And Hadrian's Wall pretty much is the northern border of the Roman Empire. 
till close to like the early 400s. I don't really spend too much time on Antonines, but Antonines was like a very peaceful period. It was the peak, peak of the Pax Romana uh, pretty much during his reign. Uh, let me get into mostly talk about Marcus Aurelius because he's really the most famous one of the bunch. So Marcus Aurelius comes in. He's the fifth of the, of the last of the five good emperors. So the last one uh, that you got he reigned about 19 years, you can see. And uh, he did co-rule with his brother. He had a brother named Lucius Verus, uh, who was actually adopted by Antoninus Pius. Uh, but Marcus Aurelius was actually like a nephew of um, Antoninus Pius by marriage. He was actually his wife's nephew, like I said. And um, Marcus Aurelius is considered to be one of the greatest emperors of the second century CE. He's, he's really a great emperor. Uh, and he was kind of seen as this philosopher. If you know about that, they, they sometimes call him that. The, the, they call him the philosopher. I think it was one of the nicknames of Marcus Aurelius. And um, he... Um, study what they call Stoicism, which was a type of Greek philosophy that was real popular in the Roman world, uh, which spread from like Greece. It was uh, founded by this Greek philosopher named Zeno, Z-E-N-O. And anyway, um, Marcus Aurelius um, wrote a, a series of books about his life, which were influenced by uh, Stoicism that became either called the Meditations or the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, written in 12 books. It was mostly written to give himself guidance in life. Uh, and um, the book became very popular in modern times. So in fact, it's one of the very few books ever written by like an emperor <laughs> of the Romans. Uh, you, you get like letters and other things maybe written or decrees written by Roman emperors, but there's hardly anything um, you know, like a book written by an emperor to give you any kind of insight into what, what they're thinking. And uh, it's believed that the meditations were written sometime when he was like actually on military campaign because he fought a lot of um, conflicts during his reign, like military wars uh, and so on. Uh, one thing that's famous about Marcus Royce's reign, they believe under his reign that the Pax Romana starts to come to an end which is true uh, because, you know, on Rome's borders, they start having a lot of wars break out, uh, mostly against two main groups that tried to attack them, which were Germanic peoples, like around the Danube re region, like around Austria and Hungary in that area. They started having a lot of problems. And the Parthians, like in Syria and Iraq, start giving them a lot of problems uh, also as well. And uh, the big one that's the, the one that's the most famous they fought in was the one they called the Marco-Manic Wars, which took up most of his reign from like 166 to 180. Uh, these were a series of wars where the Romans fought for control of the um, Danube River border. That was like one of their natural borders uh, with Germania. And a lot of these Germanic peoples were trying to push into the Roman Empire. Uh, why did they want to come into the Roman Empire? Uh, because of the fact that, um, well, they wanted to live in the Roman Empire, which was, I guess, more prosperous. Uh, but also, a lot of the a lot of the Germans were fleeing. A lot of non-Germans that were invading Germania, like the Huns, were starting to come in, and so a lot of them tried to leave, and that's what happened. Uh, in the east, Marcus Aurelius also fought a series of wars against the Parthian Empire, which is another kind of like another Iranian-type state that kind of emerged in the east, like around Iran, Iraq, and Syria. It was later called the Roman-Parthian Wars, and uh, it actually involved his brother, Lucius Verus, who was a Roman general uh, at the time, who co with his brother, uh, Marcus Aurelius, and uh, his brother was actually pretty successful with the conflict, and they even sacked the capital of uh, Iraq, Sestaphon, uh, which is um, close to where Baghdad is today. So, so yeah, they're fighting a lot of wars uh, under Marcus Aurelius. Um, and what happened was they think around 180, um, what occurred was that uh, com uh, 
if you know that communists, communists came, and there's Marx Rose right there, of course. Communists came in, who was the son of Marcus Aurelius. He would take power, like sole power, after his dad would die, after his father died. And um, he actually had ruled with his father uh, but for a few years. Uh, Marx Rose uh, made communists like his co-ruler, uh, and then... Um, Commodus came in, and Commodus, of course, was the last of the Antonine dynasty. He would rule about 12 years from 180 uh, to 192. And most historians believe that Commodus is, is the Roman emperor that basically starts the end of the Pax Romana, uh, which, in, which they think ended about 180 is the popular date uh, when the Pax Romana would come to an end. Uh, if you know much about Commodus, Commodus was kind of seen as this tyrannical ruler, kind of like a Tiberius or a Nero or Caligula, maybe all rolled into one, or Domitian, all those bad ones I talked about. And so that's the kind of ruler he was. He was kind of this uh, dictator that kind of took over the state, and there was even a cult of personality that kind of came with it. And um, Commodus actually thought he was part god. Uh, I think he thought, I think he thought he was mostly Hercules, uh, which was one of his favorite gods. And uh, Commodus was the one that was famous for fighting as a gladiator in the Colosseum. He would actually go in the Colosseum and either participate in the um, wild beast hunts, or he also would uh, fight gladiators uh, in battles, which I think a lot of them were fixed. Uh, if you read about it. So he was really a crazy emperor, uh, and uh, it got to the point where uh, some people thought he was literally insane, which he may have been. He may have been insane, uh, quite possibly. And uh, it, I think it got to the point where there was a fire that broke out, I think, in the year one, I want to say 190 was the year there was a fire in Rome. He, be, he wanted to rebuild the city and change the name. Instead of calling it Rome or Roma, he wanted to call it um, Commodiana, name it after himself. And the people got uh, mad about this, uh, a lot of the Romans, and eventually what happened was he got assassinated. That's uh, what happened. So he was killed in 192. Uh, and what happened was it touched off a civil war, uh, which lasted a year or so. And uh, in 193, uh, there was actually a deal uh, where there were actually five emperors that reigned all in the same year, mostly Roman generals vying for power. And they called that the year of the five emperors. That's what they nicknamed it. Uh, however, what happened was uh, after several months of fighting between the different generals, uh, a general named Septimius Severus seized power. And he founded his own dynasty, called the Severan Dynasty, which reigned from 193 to 235, about 40-something years. Uh, a little bit about Severus, uh, who he was. Uh, Severus was a, a former Roman general uh, that had been under, um, he had been under Emperor uh, Commodus, and uh, he took over the state. Uh, this became, of course, the so-called fifth imperial dynasty of the Roman Empire uh, that would be created, uh, Severan, Severan dynasty, you can see there. And uh, he was kind of an interesting guy, uh, Severus. He actually came from Africa. So he was of African descent, um, whether that's African or Phoenician, I think it's not sure. I think he may have been part African uh, descent. Uh, and, but he came from this uh, city called Leptis Magna, uh, which is in northern Libya today. It used to be a Roman city there a long time ago. And uh, the ruins of it are still there. Uh, and uh, Severus came in, and uh, he's important because he helped to stabilize the empire because Commodus was such a terrible emperor. And um, But the empire became very mil militaristic. That's one thing that's very famous about the um Severan dynasty, uh, the Roman arm, army became real, real powerful, and the Roman Senate began to weaken. It became more and more of a rubber stamp. Uh, and so that's something that's really true. I think the Roman army even peaked in size under 
Septimius Severus uh, as well. Uh, Severus was also famous for his wife. His wife was uh, Julia Domna, and who was from Syria. And um, she was considered, by the way, to be one of the most powerful Roman empress consorts, uh, probably in history, uh, for sure. And uh, they had two sons who were twins uh, that later became emperors. They actually, at one point, shared power with their father, like co-ruled with them uh, for a while. Now, they were Gaeta and Caracalla. And um, I never heard about these two guys, but they, they basically uh, were jealous of each other. They couldn't stand each other, uh, Caracalla and Gaeta. Uh, and um, Caracalla actually was actually called Antoninus, was his real name. Uh, Caracalla was a nickname. Uh, they called him because he wore this type of Roman cloak all the time, called a Caracalla, so the name stuck. <laughs> and then Gaeta was the more popular ruler. A lot of the Romans liked him over Caracalla. And so after their father died in 211, uh, what happened was Caracalla had his brother Gaeta murdered and took over sole possession of the empire. Very bloodthirsty dynasty, by the way, the Severans. Um, just about all of them were murdered, except for Septimius Severus, who died of natural causes. Uh, by the way, uh, Caracalla was known for developing the Baths of Caracalla, which are, the ruins are still in Rome today. He also had this thing called the Edict of Caracalla he issued in 212. What the Edict of Caracalla did uh, was it basically granted Roman citizenship to all Roman freemen. Uh, and like anywhere in the empire, if you were, you were basically uh, free, you were considered a Roman citizen, and uh, he mostly did it to raise taxes. <laughs> Uh, they had some other rulers later. Uh, the, the, the next two, Macrinus and Legabalus, kind of seized power after Caracalla was murdered, too. Uh, they weren't actually, I don't think they were related to the Severans, but they, they were kind of in the military, uh, took over. Uh, and then the last one was uh, Alexander Sever, Severus reigned 13 years. He was really the second longest reigning uh, ruler. He was murdered, too. Uh, so... Like I said, out of the six Severan emperors they had, five out of six were murdered. Now, on the bottom there, you can see uh, there was a period called the Crisis Period uh, that followed in the Roman Empire, which occurred in the third century. It was mostly from 235 to 284. Uh, the Roman Empire went through this crisis period, where they call it the political anarchy. It's called all kinds of names that they dub it. And what happened was there was a lot of anarchy that occurred, not just throughout the empire politically, socially, economically, but also behind the throne. Uh, there was a lot of infighting uh, that occurred. And uh, what happened was the military, the Roman army, started to basically take control of everything, like the empire, uh, who would become emperor uh, and all of that. And what happened was um, basically... Uh, they went through a period of like around 50 years where there were about 30 emperors that actually reigned in a short period, uh, which is less than two years, an emperor. Uh, and so all these emperors that reigned were either called barracks emperors or called soldier emperors because they all came out of the military mostly, or they were backed by the military. So they basically started killing each other off, you know, left and right. Uh, you even had a case where there'd be one emperor, and it'd be like a rival that would want to take the throne from them. And so you'd have kind of, like, it was almost like a civil war uh, between the different emperors. Uh, also, the empire, um, it broke up. That's the weird thing about it. There was a case by the, I think the 260s, uh, BC, yeah, 260 CE, uh, the empire actually broke up into separate states. It was actually two states that broke away. Uh, one called the Gaelic Empire that was like in Gaul. Uh, in Britain, mostly. And they had another one called the Palmarine Empire, uh, which mostly broke off and ruled in like Turkey, Syria, and Egypt. Uh, so you had this case where the empire was broken up into three parts, and it wasn't brought back together and reunited until 274, which was done by an emperor called Emperor Aure Aurelian. And Aurelian put, put it back together. And um, so, yeah, the third century is not a good period. 
Um, it's like it's the period of when the Roman Empire really starts to decline, which will keep declining in the West. Now, the West is going to keep falling apart uh, pretty much. And uh, they'll be threatened by waves and waves of, you know, barbarians that keep invading them, mostly Germanic. Uh, and it's going to take a while, but between basically the fourth and fifth centuries, the Western Empire will eventually collapse. That's what's going to happen. Now, before that happened, though, there was a couple em emperors that came in that kind of helped to uh, kind of restabilize the empire at this point. And there was one named uh, Diocletian uh, who came in, uh, who's pretty important. I'll talk a few minutes on on Diocletian. It's like it went out for some reason. And um, anyway, um, talk about him. Diocletian um, was a very important emperor. He kind of reigned between the second and the, excuse me, not the second, the third and the fourth centuries. Uh, and uh, his reforms helped to re-stabilize the empire, like I said. He also um, helped to strengthen the power of the emperor. Um, one of the first things he did when he came in was the emperors got a new got new titles, uh, which were seen as being more uh, autocratic. And um, there were two he actually adopted, one called Dominus and the other one named Jovius. Dominus was a term meaning lord or master in Latin. So it's like saying that I'm lord or master of everyone uh, in the Roman Empire. And then Jovius was another title, which was more of a religious title, uh, which meant Jupiter's chosen one. Uh, so he's kind of seen as the, you know, Lord of the people, but also uh, the highest religious leader, you know, associated with the Roman traditional religions at the time. Uh, of course, his most famous thing that Diocletian did was he divided the Roman Empire into, into two halves, the Western and Eastern Roman Empires. Uh, and he also created new uh, emperors in both sides. It was a Western emperor and an Eastern emperor that they created afterwards, which was called an Augustus. That's what they called it. So you had Eastern Augustus and a Western Augustus. Uh, then they also, in 293, they, and they called that a diarchy originally when they had two, two emperors. Then he went to four, four emperors. He had two more, uh, two as well. Uh, and he added these, uh, what they call a Caesar, a Western Caesar, in an Eastern Caesar. And these were like uh, subordinate emperors to the two main Augustus emperors. So you got in the West, you've got a Western Augustus with a Western Caesar under him. In the East, you've got an Eastern Augustus with an Eastern Caesar below him. And uh, they later call this whole type of government system he creates, which has four emperors, the Tetrarchy is what they called it, which meant Government ruled by four people, basically. So governed by four, by four, or ruled by four, if you want to call it that. And so, yeah, it was a new type of government uh, that they put in. And they did this because of two reasons. One uh, is because uh, it allowed um, the, uh, the ease of, of running the uh, administration of the Roman Empire. So instead of one man trying to micromanage a huge state, you've got four people, four emperors that would manage basically the whole empire, which were divided into separate provinces, etc. Also, it allowed for secession of rulers. So that meant that the Western Caesar could succeed the Western Augustus. Uh, if, say, the Western Augustus were to die, same thing in the East. The Eastern the Eastern uh, Caesar could succeed the Western Augustus. Like, it wasn't diagonal either. Uh, I think I'll show a map showing this uh, later. Uh, I've got different pictures showing, like, let me see if I can pull it up for you. But this is initially what it looked like. So when he first created in the 280s CE, uh, Diocletian set himself up as the Augustus in the East. So the Eastern Augustus over here. And he put up, he put like a Roman general, uh, Maximianus or Maximian, usually for short, 
he became the Western Augustus. And then these were all the Caesars under him. So this is the Eastern Caesar over here, Galerius. Here's the Western Caesar over here, Constantius the First Chlorus, or Constantius usually for short. So those are your uh, different, your four emperors. It was four, you know, the Tetrarchy that of course he of course created. Uh, one more thing about Diocletian, which is true uh, about him uh, as well. Um, he's the one that started the whole um, re-persecution of the Christians, which had kind of waned for a while under some of the previous uh, emperors. And over like a 10-year period from about 303 to about 313, uh, Diocletian began uh, mass persecution of Christians which was called different names. Uh, the Catholics called it the Great Persecution because uh, they went you know, after all these Christians, which was kind of exaggerated how many it was. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of people call it now the Diocletianic Persecution. It got named after him. It wasn't really his idea, though. You know, I think some of his other tetrarchs had really been behind it. Uh, but the whole the whole thing was kind of a, a move to uh, it was kind of like part of a reform, which it was uh, to try and save Roman paganism, like the traditional Roman religions, uh, which were declining because everybody was starting to convert to Christianity uh, instead. And so that's why they instituted a wave of persecutions to basically try to save the old religions. And so a lot of Christians were actually arrested. Uh, for this, uh, imprisoned or killed. Um, there's many cases where a lot of Christians uh, lost their jobs. Like if they were in the government or in the military, they were fired. Uh, they, lo they lost their property also as well. And so this went on for like 10 years uh, until Constantine the Great ended it. Right, now what happened eventually with the Tetrarchy was the system eventually collapsed. Only lasted for so many years. I think like 10, 15 years at the most. Uh, it was actually around. And um, the reason why it collapsed was due to civil war. There was a series of wars. They were called the Wars, the Tetrarchy, or Civil Wars, the Tetrarchy. They call it different names. That broke out, they think, around 306. And uh, it, it was caused by the fact that Diocletian in 305 decided to uh, basically abdicate uh, because he was ill. Uh, so he retired, basically, more or less. And so all the different emperors, you know, that wanted the throne started fighting over it, uh, kind of like before. It's almost like a re repeat of the crisis period again. And um, what happened was you got these two two guys here. Um, well, actually, what was in the east, you had Galerius. You saw before that basically, he basically became the next ruler uh, that replaced uh, Diocletian that came in. And he had, by the way, uh, Diocletian, when he retired, had made Maximianus retire too, like abdicate. Uh, but what happened was infighting started. Uh, if you go back to that map I just showed you, uh, which is right here, um, he was forced to abdicate along with Diocletian. So Constantius came in. He became the emperor uh, 305. However, he died right afterwards, like 306 of natural causes, which left kind of a problem. And so what occurred was um, Constantius had a son named Constantine. He was a Roman general. He, he started vying for power to get the throne. Maximinus wanted the job back. So he started fighting over it too. And Maxentius was the son of Maximianus. So now you got three men basically trying to take over uh, the empire uh, here. And it leads to kind of a civil war in the West to, to decide, you know, who's going to eventually take it over. Uh, eventually what happens is Constantine comes in. He's going to defeat all the other powers. And he'll take over. Uh, and um, so he'll seize power eventually. And uh, one thing about Constantine, which is very, very famous, of course, about him, is that he later becomes the first Christian emperor. Uh, he becomes basically one of the first emperors that's really sympathetic uh, toward the Christian cause, 
they think during the Civil War uh, that Constantine converted, they say at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, but I don't know if that's really a true story or not. Some people think it's kind of a fiction, which was in Rome. So, but he went on to eventually defeat uh, the West, becoming the, the Western Augustus at that point. Then later what happened is that he then went on and he defeated the Eastern Emperor too, uh, defeated him as well. Uh, and uh, by 324, uh, one of the things that Constantine the Great would end up doing, of course, is he would unify the state under one emperor from 324 to 337, and had had that since Diocletian uh, in 285, I think it is. So it's been that long since it's been ruled by just one person uh, at that point. So, so that's basically what Constantine was. Constantine would, of course, go on to found his own dynasty, which is often called sometimes the Constantinian dynasty. He's also a saint in the Catholic and Orthodox churches today. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about Constantine. I'll kind of get in and, and kind of discuss some of the things that he's very famous for. Uh, one of the first things he did uh, as emperor uh, was he uh, issued an edict that's called the Edict of Milan, uh, which was issued in the year 313 in Italy. And it's one of like a couple um, of these edicts that were passed at the time, uh, which basically legalized Christianity and made it a legal religion uh, within the Roman Empire, and it effectively ended uh, the Roman persecutions of Christians. So what that meant was that now Christians could practice a religion uh, without persecution or, or arrest. Uh, and also a lot of the Christians, um, I think, were given their land back or property back uh, afterwards. So that's one of his first great things that he did. Uh, although it's debated about when uh, Constantine converted. Uh, some believe it was not until it's on its deathbed, uh, and not like maybe, maybe during the actual civil wars of the Tetrarchy. Uh, his most famous thing that he did, uh, Constantine, of course, was he formed the first Council of Nicaea, which met uh, in northern Turkey on the Black Sea. Uh, this, of course, was a very important church council of the early Christian church. Uh, if you know much about it, uh, it basically created a lot of the main theology that would be the basis of like, like the Roman Catholic Church, you know, et cetera, and also the Orthodox Church, uh, which would be later. Uh, they created a lot of the church canon. Uh, they basically uh, created the so-called Christian Bible. The New Testament was compiled uh, by this council. Uh, ecumenical council is basically a council of like uh, church officials, like bishop, priests, uh, etc. And um, what are some things that the Council of Nicaea did? Uh, well, one thing it did was it banned heretical forms of Christianity that didn't adhere to Trinitarianism, the belief in the Trinity and all that. And uh, there was one religion that was a form of Christianity that was called Arianism or also called Arian Christianity. And it was a type of Christianity that was founded by this Libyan priest named Arius, um, who I think had been practicing in Egypt and all that. And his, his belief about God was that God was two things. It was the Father and the Son. And the Father begot the Son, but they didn't believe that they were one and the same. Now, they actually believed that the Father and the Son were separate. I think they even thought the Father was greater than the Son, which was kind of controversial because the religion is supposed to be about Jesus. Uh, so uh, the church said that was wrong. And so they they what they did was they pushed the idea of Trinitarianism as one of the main theological ideas about what God is uh, in the Christian church. And, of course, that is the fact that God is made up of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are three things, but it's one. Uh, and so that whole thing was, you know, formulated by a lot of the early church fathers going back to the 200s CE or third century. And that became the basis of pretty much all the different Christian faiths that'll, you know, come later uh, over time. Uh, also, they put into a lot of the masses 
so-called Nicene Creed, uh, if you know what that is, the Nicene Creed is like a Christian's prayer of faith. Uh, and the reason why they put it in there uh, was because they wanted to the, the make all Christians add hair to the whole Trinity. They put it's basically got the Trinity in it. And so if you don't say that part, you're not really a true Christian because uh, you don't believe in the Trinity. So uh, the term creed, uh, of course, was derived from the word credo, which means I believe. So I believe the Trinity, uh, more or less. So obviously Aryan Christians wouldn't be able to say that part, uh, you know, about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because they don't believe it. So that kind of kicked them out. Uh, also, another thing about the early church was that the early church under Constantine the Great created a lot of the dates you've heard about, like, you know, Easter, when Easter occurs, you know, Mardi Gras and Easter occur, like, in the spring. It's all because of the, con the, the, church, the uh, Council of Nicaea. So they set that, uh, which was set in the spring. It's all set because of Passover, because the, the Christians believe that Jesus was crucified around Passover or Eve of Passover. And so that's that's the reason for that. Also, the uh, Council of Nicaea moved the Christian Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Most people don't know that either. No, they did. Uh, they did this because the fact that on Saturday, that was the day, like a holy day for pagans and Jews. And so they didn't want to, have to be on the same day as they, as they were. And also Sunday is the day when Jesus supposedly resurrected, like Easter Sunday. Uh, Constantine also commissioned the first Bibles, like especially the New Testament, uh, which was all compiled. Uh, so the Council of Nicaea was supposedly the council that decided what books would go into it. They even voted on which gospel accounts would be put into it, uh, which is true uh, about that. Uh, and um, what happened was the, the Bible was written in Greek, if you know about this. Uh, and then what happened over time was translated to Latin, uh, which they think St. Jerome started doing at the end of the 4th century with the so-called Latin Bible or Vul Vulgate Bible version that they had. And it's like, you know, if you say about the different churches, the Orthodox Church, you know, used the Greek Bible, and then the Catholic Church used the Latin Bible. So that's, that's the, one of the big differences between those two main Christian churches that would kind of break away uh, from each other, you know, at medieval times later. Uh, one thing about Constantine, one more he's famous for, he's famous for a lot of things, Constantine the Great. Uh, he also founded a new capital, Roman Empire, uh, which, of course, was Constantinople, which was founded in 330 CE. Uh, and if you know about it, it became an actual, what they call a Christian city was the first Christian city ever founded, uh, which was just, it just has churches in it and no other religion. Uh, and it was founded in Western Turkey on the European side, south of the Black Sea. So it's more in the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, close to like the trade routes from Asia. And uh, the people at first didn't want to call it, Const well, they didn't want to call it Constantinople. I think the original name they were going to call it was going to be called New Rome. Or at least that's the idea that um, that he wanted to call it that. He wanted to call it that, Nova Roma or New Rome. Uh, but the people started either calling it Constantinople or they called it a city because uh, there wasn't too many other cities there. Turkey was at the time was kind of an isolated area, was undeveloped. And so the term city was the evolution of where the word Istanbul came from, which is the modern name. Uh, what they call Constantinople now. And um, supposedly the name Istanbul came from a saying that they used to say about Constantinople. And that was like, let's go to the city. And so that's what Istanbul meant. Um, Constantinople, by the way, was a heavily fortified peninsula. It was a peninsula where they actually constructed the actual city. And... Um, it was actually built on top of an ancient Greek city that was called Byzantium or Byzantium, which is where the name Byzantine comes from. And uh, the city itself was actually built near the Sea of Marmara, which is below the Black Sea. 
and it becomes the future capital of what they call later the Eastern Roman Empire. And of course, now they call it Byzantine, you know, like I said, uh, because the fact that there was this old city there in Greek times, and the city was founded around 330 CE by, by um, Constantine the Great. A lot of times they date the Byzantine Empire from there uh, to like 1453. Uh, of course, they didn't really call it Byzantine Empire later or Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, they call it obviously the Roman Empire you know, themselves, but some people actually called it Romania, which is where the country's named today, which is in that area now called Romania. Uh, like I said, um, they had dynasties, like the two last dynasties that they had at the end of the um, – Roman Empire. You had the Constantinian uh, dynasty, which most of the emperors that were in it were Christian. Uh, there was one emperor that was not, who was named Julian. Who <laughs> Actually, he was called the apostate. I think they dubbed him. He actually tried to reconvert everybody to the pagan religions. But I think they killed him. That was like the last pagan emperor they had <laughs> after that. Uh, then they had Theodosian dynasty, uh, which came in which reigned between the fourth uh, and the fifth fifth one. That one is considered to be one of the last major dynasties that reigns over the later empire, like before it separates in the West collapse. And um, Emperor Theodosius the Great, he was the guy that founded, I don't have a picture of him, but I do have a slide on him I can show you. He actually was considered one of the last great emperors. Uh, of the of the actual um, empire before it split like permanently uh, later, and um, under him, one of the things that happened, uh, if you study about it, was he was the one that actually uh, began to um, convert everybody to Christianity. He had the Christianization of the whole Roman Empire. A lot of this happened starting in the 380s, and then under the 390s, he pretty much began to convert everybody. And uh, for about three or four years, from about 392 to 395, Theodosius the Great was actually the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. And by the way, the last to do that, last to be sole ruler, because uh, afterwards it split pretty much afterwards. And um, there was an edict he issued in 380 called the Edict of Thessalonica. Uh, what that edict did was it basically made Nicene Christianity uh, the state religion of the whole empire. Uh, so that meant that there would be effectively no other religions that were made legal, uh, especially that were like pagan or whatever. And so a lot of pagans uh, that were practicing their old religions, they were imprisoned or killed, or they were, I think a lot of them were forced to convert uh, to Christianity. And so it's kind of like reverse of what happened before. You know, when the Christians got persecuted, it was the pagans' time. Uh, I believe it did not include Jews. Uh, they were kind of exempt because uh, they went back, you know, a long time ago. Uh, so they weren't really included. Uh, but this mostly included like pagans. Uh, also, uh, if you see there, uh, Theodosius was the one that got rid of the Olympics. And that's something he's famous for. Maybe 393 CE, maybe when it ended. Uh, but he basically got rid of the Olympics because it was kind of seen as this pagan spectacle and all that. After Theodosius died, what happened was the Roman Empire then split among his um, two sons, uh, which were uh, Honorius, uh, who was um, ruled over the Western Empire, you can see, and Arcadius uh, that ruled over the Eastern Empire. So they gave, like, each, gave each, each son half of it, uh, pretty much. And after that, it never got back together. Like, neither, neither empire really, you know, reformed or whatever. Uh, and so from there, the two states basically separated uh, is, is what happened. Uh, and so one of the things that occurs next, uh, if you know about it, is the Western Empire basically collapses. Uh, is one of the things that, that I'm going to talk about. I've got a few minutes left. I can kind of at least start. I don't know if I'll finish it, but I can at least start on it more or less. 
Uh, there's a lot of different causes of why the Roman Empire fell apart. You could, you know, do economic, social, political reasons uh, for it. There is one reason that's the most famous that a lot of people think was pretty much the main reason why it happened. They got invaded. <laughs> uh, they got invaded by all these different barbarian peoples that came in. They usually call it the invasion of the barbarians. I think is the common name. Uh, they called it in. Basically, the West collapsed due to various invasions by Germanic peoples and also other types of peoples that came into Europe that were from like Asia. Uh, and so it helped contribute to why, you know, the, the Roman Empire uh, began to collapse at that point. They think it actually went back to the time of the crisis period and probably before that like back to like the second century, I think as far back as there, but they, they had like going back to the Mark Marco Manic Wars. It's probably when it started the, at, at the most. And um, the period of when this happens in Germany has often been called in modern times, the migration period or the period of migration of the Germanic peoples. Uh, the Germans actually call it a name. They call it the Volker Wandering, which means the wandering of the people. And so starting around the fourth century, especially, you see a lot of Germanic peoples start pushing in uh, to the Roman Empire. This happens like between the fourth and the eighth centuries uh, overall. And it's like wave after wave after wave of these different Germanic peoples come in. And you also have some non-Germanic, like from Asia, like the Huns that come in uh, as well. And um, they're really unable to stop it. Uh, in the West, and it caused the whole Western Empire uh, to eventually collapse. It was one of the things that will, of course, occur because of it. Now, you saw the bottom there, that little thing there. The Ger the Romans wanted soldiers. They needed soldiers. They, they had a shortage of people. Um, the birth rates in, in, in the Roman Empire were dropping a lot. And so a lot of these uh, non, they, ha they hired a lot of people, like non-Roman soldiers, you know, were in the armies. Uh, but they hired a lot, which a lot of them were Germanic. Uh, and um, these became auxiliary forces that were called federati, uh, or which means ally, like the Visigoths and the Franks and all these other uh, Germans that came in. They were hired. And uh, when they would come in, uh, they were made, you know, permanent Roman citizens. And then they could raise taxes from them, which is part of what they wanted too. So they needed manpower, you know, to field their armies. And then they also needed taxation to pay for everything. So, so a lot of these Germanic peoples, you know, start, you know, fighting for the Romans. Uh, however, what happened later was that they turned on the Roman Empire. It was one of the things that occurred. I do have a map showing uh, how, you know, the, the different areas like in the Roman Empire, they got invaded at one point. You can see in the West, they get attacked all over the place. Uh, by different peoples. And um, I'll kind of go through some of the different groups that came in that were famous, that were Germanic peoples that invaded. Uh, these are the main groups that came in. You had the Goths, who were probably the most famous, uh, which were like the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. Uh, you had the Vandals, uh, you had the Franks, uh, the Burgundians, and then the Anglo Saxons uh, from Northern Europe like the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. And that's just some of them. It's kind of the main ones that are you know, the most famous that, that attacked attacked uh, the Roman Empire uh, at one point. Um, over time, a lot of these um, Germanic peoples would overrun the empire. Like the Visigoths at one point sacked Rome in 410. Um, and they even settled in Spain, uh, the Visigoths. They took over like Spain. And they formed their own state, which was later called the Visigothic Kingdom. Uh, Ostrogoths, who were like the cousins of the Visigoths, also attacked the Roman Empire. They seized control of Italy eventually, uh, which formed their own state too, which was called the Ostrogothic Kingdom. So you get this case where all these different people start marching in and they just carve up the Roman Empire uh, in the West into their own states. Uh, the Vandals, you see that blue lines, going throughout uh, the West, through uh, France and Spain, and then they attacked North Africa, the Vandals. And the Vandals 
would actually seize control of North Africa. They would take it over and they would create the so-called Vandelic kingdom uh, that they had uh, as well. And they also, just like the Visigoths, sacked Rome too in 455. And it got so bad in the West that the Romans moved the capital from Ravenna. They actually moved it to uh, from uh, Rome to a place called Ravenna, which is right here uh, in the upper part of the Adriatic. So the capital is actually here and not Rome because uh, it's getting sacked so many times. Uh, also, another group, they had the Franks. Franks came in next from Germany, uh, and they attacked Gaul and uh, settled there. And they formed their own state later called the Kingdom of the Franks. Uh, and this became known as Francia, as they nicknamed it later. And I told you already about the Anglo-Saxons, uh, who are way up in, you can see way up there uh, where they are. If you go to this um, map right here, so you got the Franks coming in here. Anglo-Saxons are up here. They crossed the North Sea by sh using ships. They attacked Rome and Britain and seized control of that too, uh, also as well. So all they're, they're in there, you know, taking over, you know, that area, you know, also as well. So all that, all those, you know, different Germanic peoples, like I said, formed their own kingdoms at that point, and it caused the decline of the Roman Empire. Is a viable state, especially in the West, uh, that's going to occur. And I'm going to get to it later, but there's going to be another group that's going to come in. I'm kind of running out of time today. Probably stop. It's a good stopping point. But um, they also have the Huns come in. The Huns are going to come in next. And they help to precipitate, you know, the decline of the Roman Empire. And the Huns were these nomadic peoples that came out of Mongolia that crossed, uh, I guess, Asia through Russia. Uh, into Central Europe. Uh, there's a theory that they were somehow descended from the Shang Nu uh, that attacked China and the Great Wall like a long time ago. And uh, the Huns were um, eventually came through into Europe and they settled around where the, um, the uh, Danube River is region, now called Austria and Hungary. That's where Hungary gets its name, uh, from the Huns. And uh, they created an empire that was called the Hunnic Empire which is also sometimes called, by the way, Pannonia. That's what they dub it. Yeah, Pannonia. And um, the Huns were, were, were very scary people. Uh, they were very feared. Uh, They're paganistic. Uh, they were not Christian. They're very warlike. They would just massacre whole populations when they would take cities. Men, women, and children, just kill them all. They're brutal. Uh, and traditionally, they were known, of course, were fighting on horseback, uh, kind of like the Mongols do later. And they fought with composite bow and sword. Now, later I will get to, I'll probably start talking more about it because I'm running out of time, but we'll talk about Attila the Hun. Uh, Attila was their greatest king. Uh, and Attila is going to, of course, if you know about it, he's going to try to attack the West, uh, like Italy and France. He even tries to attack the Eastern Roman Empire. And he almost succeeds in conquering parts of the empire. He almost does uh, in the mid-5th century. So I'll talk about that, how that kind of helps to cause the collapse of the Roman Empire. Then I'm going to talk about the early Middle Ages, of course, on Wednesday uh, as well. So that's pretty much it for today. Uh, did Before I go, I wanted to remind you, too, don't forget about the various assignments I've got posted. Uh, of course, the big thing you need to work on now is to try to get your second exam done. Uh, if you remember correctly, I did have a problem with one of the second exams I, I showed you earlier. Uh, there was a, a link that was missing for the Hellenistic quiz. Not, not the quiz, Hellenistic uh, lecture uh, that I had. I put that in there. Uh, so I fixed that for some, I don't, some reason. It wasn't in there for some reason. But um, the second exam will not be due till Friday. So you have extra time on that to get that done. But do get that done because a lot of you haven't really started on it yet much on that assignment. And don't forget, I did put up a new, uh, the last the last final uh, Canvas quiz before the final exam has been posted too, which is on early Roman history as well. And don't forget, if you haven't turned your vocab in the second one, you know, just send that to me or post it to the speed grader. So that's it for today. Uh, if you have any questions about this lecture, let me know. 
Uh, you can send me comments, questions through YouTube or email me if you got a question about something uh, also as well. Uh, so that's it for today of this lecture. Like I said, on Wednesday, I will continue, of course, talking about the Middle Ages next. So we're getting into that. And that's going to be our last topic toward the final exam. So I'll see you later. Hope you all have a good rest of the week uh, overall. So take care.